being with you here at Comer Baptist and to everyone who is joining virtually and not present with us in our church building. We welcome you as well, wherever you may be at home or maybe watching this at, <clears throat> at a later date. You're very welcome as we come um, as part of our routine to meet on the Lord's Day to give our praise and our worship to our great God and how great it has been it has been to be able to do that physically over the last number of months having been many many months having to do it virtually online we're very grateful that we can meet in person in safe surroundings we have come to, to worship God and we will be singing our praise to God we will be praying to God we'll hear him is uh, we'll hear from his word as well and at the close of our service we will have our time around the table as we remember ultimately what our God has done for us through his son Jesus Christ and his precious sacrifice we look forward to that time as well no real announcements uh, to really make you aware of obviously this is our only service uh, today and we meet as usual on a Tuesday at 8 p.m. for a Bible study and prayer as we continue in our worship, I want to read some words from Psalm 119. I'm not going to read the whole Psalm 119, you'll be glad to know, but just a few words from Psalm 119 and verse 97 before we sing our first song of praise. Psalm 119, just a few words from verse 97 onwards. And the psalmist says, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers for you. Your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And as I said, we'll be considering God's word throughout our service, but ultimately as we open it up um, later on and to hear from it and to hear what God has to say to us uh, this morning as we consider it and we realize what God's word is to us that it is a lamp to our feet it is a light to our path and that is how gracious God has been to us to offer this to us and we have so much to give thanks to God and we're going to start and we're going to sing our praise to him and let's stand and let's sing softly as we sing our opening praise item. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Thank you. Oh, 
Let's praise God as we come to him in prayer, and let us pray. Father, thank you for that song as we have just been singing, the, the call within it, the call for everything that has breath to give you your praise, the praise that you and you alone deserve. No one else deserves the praise of everything that has breath. You deserve our praise because you are worthy, you are a great and gracious God. You're a God who has revealed himself to us, that you have made yourself known. You've made, us, made yourself known through the wonders of, of creation. We can know you through your inspired word, but we know you ultimately through the life and the testimony of your son, Jesus Christ, the living and eternal word. And Lord, we thank you for his life. Thank you for his faithfulness and his patience and for his willingness and obedience to go to the cross on our behalf to take our punishment on that tree at Calvary. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins because of the shed blood of your son, Jesus. Father, we come out of routine, uh, we come part of our uh, regular practice to meet here, and, but it's so much more than that. We come to hear from you and we come to give you our praise. And though we ask very simply and humbly that our worship would be acceptable in your sight, that it would be like a sweet and savouring offering. Lord, we ask that you would speak to us, that you would bless and encourage us in our own souls because of our meeting this morning. And we ask this in your mighty and powerful name. Amen and amen. We want to sing our second item of praise, 10,000 Reasons. Bless the Lord as we consider the many, many, many reasons there is to give praise to our great God. And as usual, let's stand and let's sing together. Thank you. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul I worship your holy name The sun comes up It's a
is failing, the end draws near, and my time has come. Still, my soul will sing your praise on ending. Ten thousand years and then forever. We have many things to give thanks to God for, uh, many things to bring before him, and we come to a point in our service where we will bring our prayers, uh, our praise, and our intercession to God. So let's, let's bow our heads, and let's pray to God as we think of those who are ill, we think of those who are recovering, think of Clifford uh, preaching in, in Shankill as well, uh, many other things going on in our lives and right across our world. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you that we can come before you, that we can bring our prayer to you. Whatever our heart condition, whatever our situation, circumstance, wherever we we may be, Lord, we can always come to you. Lord, thank you that you have made that way possible. Lord, thank you for our great high priest who listens and brings our prayers right to the throne room of heaven. So Lord, I pray that we would have confidence whenever we do pray and that we would have confidence as we pray right now as we give you our thanks for for who you are but also for what you have done in our lives. Thank you for the safety that you have provided for ourselves and for our families and how you have protected us over these last number of months in the midst of a pandemic. Lord, thank you that you have been close to us and we have known and felt your presence. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to meet again. Lord, thank you that you are with us as we meet here. And Lord, we ask that we would know your presence. Father, we do pray for our church family. Thank you for those gathered and those who listen at home and who would love to be here. Lord, we pray for those who are ill in health, who have undergone operations, who have been feeling under the weather. Lord, would you bring restoration and healing to them. Lord, we thank you for the good news regarding Derek and thank you for the the successful operation he has went through and thank you as he has been been able to return home and is currently recovering. And Lord, we, we give you our praise for that and we pray that you would continue to heal and restore him and Lord we ask that you'd bring him back to a full uh, bill of health and that sooner rather than later that he'd be back out here. Pray for Ruby as well and pray that you would be with her and be all that she needs at this time. 
Father, we do pray for Norman as well and pray for him as he recovers at home. And we do pray for Hazel at this time. Father, we pray for Clifford um, as he um, opens God's word in Shankle Baptist. Lord, we pray that you would speak mightily through him. Father, that you would use him for your glory and for your honor, and that you would bless as, as the word is open and preached in Shankle, and for those who will sit under it, Lord, that they would be blessed and encouraged in their faith. Father, we also do pray for our association of churches. Lord, we pray for all of our churches right across the island. Lord, we pray for those who um, are only just returning to to physical gatherings. Pray for them as they um, will go through that process. Pray for them on a logistical level that you would help and, and guide them. Father, we do pray for the, 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 the college, the Irish Baptist College, as they have had students return the last uh, couple of weeks. Thank you for uh, students, for those uh, willing to uh, come and to, to learn and to have a desire to step out in faith, to, to, to stop what they are currently doing, to study full time. Uh, Father, we pray that as they prepare for, for service, for, for ministry, Lord, that their, their hearts would be put to use. And Lord, that they would be conformed and made more in the likeness of, of you. Lord, that they will not go to, to study just for the sake of increasing their knowledge, but they would have a deep desire to grow in their love of you so that they could serve you better in whatever situation lies ahead of them. Pray for the staff and the lecturers and all that goes on in the college in very strange environment and setting. Lord, we pray that you would bless and undertake for all of the needs of our college in this incoming academic year. Father, as we in a few moments hear from your word, uh, Father, we ask that you would open our hearts And Lord, that we would realize that this is uh, you speaking. And Father, we ask that you would speak to us as only you can speak to us through the power of your Holy Spirit. And we ask all this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. And in preparation for um, to hear God's word, we're going to sing a very appropriate song together. Open the eyes of my heart. A prayer for asking God to speak to us. And that's what we have come to do today. We've come to hear from the living word of God. So as as usual, let's stand. Let's sing uh, quietly as we think and meditate upon this song together. Thank you.
We have a copy of God's Word, which I hope that you do. Please turn with me to James chapter 3. As we've, well, I have been looking through and following the, the letter of the Apostle James to this persecuted group of, of Christians who had originally been from Jerusalem, where James would have been their, their dear pastor, but now they are somewhat scattered, and he's writing to them very on, much on a practical level and helping them and encouraging them in their faith. James chapter 3, I'm going to read this section, verse 1 to 12 in my Bible. It's entitled Taming the Tongue, which is very appropriate and gives the flavor of what we are going to consider this morning. This is God's word, James chapter 3, beginning of verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, He is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member Yet it boasts of great things. How great a force is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. And we know, we believe that God will bless the public reading of his word. I don't really need to know you well to know that you love to talk. You love to talk. We are always talking. We are very talkative people, especially this part of the world. We just love conversations. We love to talk in various situations, whether that is a a conversation with, with a friend over a nice cup of tea whether that is online, we have conversations online, whether that's through email or we can, through social media or we can text people, we can obviously use phone calls as well and even we can talk to ourselves. Actually, I would argue the person you talk to the most is yourself. You're always having an inner conversation with yourself. Now, the problem is whenever that conversation becomes audible. Now, there's when problems may arise for yourself. And it becomes even worse when you start to answer yourself as well. So be careful not to fall into that trap. We are always talking. For you and I live in a world that is full and filled with words. Words are everywhere. If we didn't have words... It wouldn't be, wouldn't be the world that we live in. Words are everywhere we go. There isn't a day, there isn't a moment where you aren't thinking of words, you aren't seeing words, you aren't speaking words. 
And we need to realize the power that words have, both from us, but also upon us. Because words matter. Words matter. The words you and I speak are highly significant. They have the power to to change you, to influence your life decisions and choices. So it's crucial that we understand the power of our words. But the problem is, we don't. We all too often condense our words, our conversations into momentary instances and we think of them as meaningless and as insignificant and that they don't really count for anything. But the reality is, your life is filled from top to bottom with those momentary instances. You know, I'm I'm sure you're a little bit like me. We like to think that we live very grand and impressive lives. That we're always on the the mountaintops of our lives. But that's not really our lives, is it? Usually we we live in the the ordinary and in in the mundane. And really we have only a few fleeting mountaintop experiences in our lives. We live in the ordinary and the mundane for most of our lives. And that is where we find those little, every moment by moment conversations that fill your days and weeks, months and years that are in themselves filled with words. Words are powerful. And we see that the power of words ultimately through the words of God himself. Think back right to the very beginning. In our minds we think of Genesis chapter 1 and we see the the power of words. We, we, We read about God, God speaking. God speaking and from nothing becomes something. Even, this is just an incredible thought, even before humanity was formed, God was speaking. Words existed before we existed. God was speaking and he wasn't, speaking, wasn't just speaking to, just to the ceiling of, of some sort of sense, but as God is relationship with himself, he was speaking internally. We see the power and the, the benefit of words being spoken. Equally, words can be used detrimentally. As much as God speaks So does Satan. To lure Eve to the forbidden fruit, Satan uses words to deceive her. Did God really say you could not eat from any tree in the garden? We see Satan using deceitfully using words time and time again. And what we have in in James chapter 3 is how I would summarize is a theology of of words. And the Apostle James within this section, I I, I very strongly believe, wants to teach us two things. Two very simple things, but two very profound things, which I'm sure you've probably grasped. And I'm going to summarize them in these two points. The first point is that I want us to see the potential of our words, the potential of of our talk, of our speech. I'll use that language interchangeably. And then secondly, what our words, what our talk, what our speech reveals about ourselves. There's our two points, the potential of our words and what our words reveal. But there's a, there's a, there's a start-off section within this section that we, we need to highlight. And it's no surprise where James starts this section. Once we're thinking of words and we're thinking of speech, uh, he starts with, with teaching. Read verse, verse 1 with me again. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. 
I could say any of us could argue that the, the most influential area where our words or where words are used in our world is in the realm of teaching, whether that's in this context, whether that is in an educational context, school, university, or where it is in some coaching or maybe, maybe even on a one-to-one level. Teaching is a very wide field. Now, whenever we think of our experience at school, college, or if you went to university, I'm sure we will all think about teachers that we had in those various settings. I can think about that. I've been thinking about that, the teachers that I had uh, back in school. And we will think of the, the teachers who had, we had a really good relationship with, those that we had a good rapport with, and those who, who taught us well. And we will be very thankful for them. But on the flip side, we also think of those teachers who we, we will wonder till our very last breath how they actually ended up as teachers because they didn't teach you one single thing and you probably thought they were entirely useless. I encountered a couple of them in my days in school and we, 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 we look back and we sort of maybe have a wry smile as we think of, of the teachers that we had, both good and bad. But whenever we think of, of those good teachers that taught us well, we'll think of the impact that they had on our lives. Think of the think of a, a, a teacher who would be involved in in offering career advice. Maybe this is your experience. Maybe it was the conversation a teacher had with you that led you to choose specific subjects, that then led you to choose a particular career path that might have went into employment or to university. Maybe that all started with the words of a teacher. The words of a teacher has have the potential to impact many, many lives. However, as we think of teaching in the church in this context, we quickly realize the increased level of responsibility and that there's a greater weight involved. And James starts with a warning in the first couple of verses of James 3. Very stern warning to those who, who seek to teach in the church. And this has certainly been humbling for, for me to, to think about this in the past week. But there is, a, there is a principle for every Christian within this verse that we can see clearly. We need to understand that the responsibility that we all have as, as Christians as we share God's word, that we must do it understanding the responsibility that we have. We're all involved in this kingdom project. We are all a part of God's family. It's not up to you know, the, the professional Christians to do the, all the Christian work. No, that's not the case whatsoever. But whatever your, your, your life, whatever your life looks like, whatever ministry you're involved in, if it's youth work, Sunday school teaching, or simply just sharing God's word with a friend or family member whenever the time arises, we need to understand the responsibility of that, but also the privilege of that as well. However, James is, as I've already said, first and foremost, he's referring to the teachers of the word, to, to the pastor, to the, to the preacher. And we look, at, we look at Timothy and Titus for the, the qualifications that are set out for, for elders and pastors and, and deacons. And we see pretty, pretty intense lists for, for, for men to, to reach those, uh, those, that, the, the status of leaders in the church. See, see how James says, um, you know that we, that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. He's talking to a group of people. He says, you know, you know. He's talking to a group of teachers who are probably influencing the church James is writing to. They're, they're well aware of the, the great responsibility of teaching God's word. Probably they're, they're teaching false 
doctrine, probably what James has just referred to at the end of chapter 2 that we considered a couple of weeks ago, this sort of easy beliefism that sort of says, yeah, I have faith in God, but I don't really do any works. But you can do works and faith, but, you know, I'm just going to have faith. That's all I need. That's all. That's all it is. James is countering that. He doesn't want to have anything to do with that. And James wants to warn these teachers of their responsibility and of the judgment that lies ahead, the stricter judgment that lies ahead. And it's, inf- and it's important to think of those two words. There's a judgment, but there's a stricter judgment for the teachers, for those who will be, that will come and will share God's word, much as the joy and privilege that that is for God to gift an individual to do something like this. But there's a judgment that lies ahead that we will give an account for every word Now that goes for all of us. We will give an account for what we have done. But for the teacher, there's a stricter judgment that awaits on that final day. So what does that all mean as we think of this sort of introductory section to this this entire section from James? Well, two things. And in one sense, I'm I'm preaching very much to myself. But for all of us, for, for teachers, whatever the context, we need to recognize the responsibility. They acknowledge the weight of sharing God's word. It shouldn't overwhelm us. It shouldn't leave us that we don't do anything. But we just need to understand and recognize that we're not just simply sharing the rambling thoughts of our minds. We need to stay close to his word to make sure that we are being faithful to it. But for all of us, we need, and I would encourage all of us, to be praying for our teachers, for our pastors, for our elders, for our deacons. Oh, how easy it is to leave a place like this and complain. And you can complain away to me in person, I don't mind, but how often we have went and left the church and we have complained about insignificant things. Oh, pastor went on five minutes too long. Ah, that there wasn't enough illustrations in the, in the sermon and so on and so forth. It, was, it just didn't feel like it was any use to me. And really, we should be asking more important questions. Well, was he faithful to the text? Did he declare God's truth? Was the gospel evidence? We need to continuously not be complaining about our leaders, but praying for our leaders in the church context. It's a weighty responsibility. It's a privilege. But it's not easy. And the pastor, preacher, elder deacon cannot do it on their own. They need the prayers and support of the Christians. Because as verse 2 plainly states and starts, we all stumble. The teachers, James includes himself in this. We all stumble. Need to notice the we that he says here. Everyone must admit their fallen nature that they cannot achieve perfection for. If someone was to attain, if if there was a, a, someone was to come up here to be the, the eloquently speak, they would be, and not to stumble, then they would be a perfect man. They would be perfect. Perfect in speech would mean that they were a perfect individual, according to James. But we all know that that is not possible. We give evidence time and time again that we stumble through our speech. We say things that we shouldn't. We say too much. We even speak in in the wrong tone. We give, fail to give important information. We give our version of events and miss out key information. And that leads us to what I had already said previously. And that leads us to consider the potential of our words. And to underline the point that we all do in fact stumble and that we need to recognize the potential of our words. James offers three illustrations in verses three to five. And the same idea is conveyed in each that something small, almost insignificant, can have great power. The first two illustrations, a a small bit in the mouth of a horse enables a a jockey to to lead and guide a powerful animal. The small rudder on the base of a ship enables the captain to steer the boat in the direction he wants. But 
But before sharing the third picture, the third illustration, James states that, it gives a summary, he says that, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. And this is what the apostle wants to drive deep down into our understanding. Something as, as small as the tongue in your mouth can have a huge impact on your life and indeed the lives of others. Words, though they may often seem insignificant and meaningless, are always driving and guiding the course of your life. But then straight away, James adds a third illustration. We read about it in the second half, verse 5. He says this, How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. Just one small spark can set a whole forest ablaze. I'm sure you've seen on, on news images on, on our television screens of forest fires, where that may be in Australia or in, in California in the United States. And we see those pictures and there's a shrinking feeling that comes over us, isn't there? It's almost overwhelming as we look at those images and we see the immensity and the ferocity of the flames. For miles and miles, we just see fire engulfing trees and wildlife. And whenever we see that for miles and miles, we need to remember that that all started with one single flame. Now, with the example James gives of a a horse and a ship, we would generally perceive them to be of of use, of value. There's something good and valuable with with those illustrations. But with the forest fire, we immediately think of destruction, of loss, and calamity. And that's what James explicitly connects the the tongue to, the forest fire. And with this, he's creating a platform for what he wants to say in in the preceding verses. He's going to dig deeper what the tongue or our words reveal about our conditions. Read verses 6 to 8 with me for a few moments. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. The imagery is vivid by James. He places in our mind's eye the disaster of a a vast forest fire. And then in the next breath he says the tongue is the exact same. The same damage that a great forest fire can cause is similar to the words that leave your mouth. Our very tongues can cause so much pain. They can destroy. They can turn something that was full of life and bring about death. It's really a bleak diagnosis of our words from James. And we really don't have any other alternative in regards to the impact of our wor- that our words can have. Our words are, as James will say, they're unrighteous. They're, they're stained for the simple fact that we are unrighteous and stained from the core of our beings. James is reminding us of, the, of our spiritual condition that every human being embodies. We may think of words from Paul in Romans chapter 3, this great chapter, this humbling chapter of the unrighteousness of ourselves. In verse 13, 14, Paul says these words. He says, Their throat is an open grave. They use their their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Do we hear what Paul is saying here? Everyone has sinned and has fallen short of the glory of God. And that means every fiber of our beings has been infected with sin. And that includes our speech and our words. But to compound the the situation further, coming back to James, we can't even tame our tongues. All kinds of animals can be tamed over over time. Yet it is impossible for you to tame your tongue. 
I hope you're encouraged as you've been thinking about this. This is really encouraging stuff. Not one bit. There's not enough inner strength within any of us to tame our tongues. Because if we could, it comes back to what James already said. We'd be perfect. But newsflash, none of us are perfect. And the words that we give, that we speak, give daily evidence that we need outside intervention. That we need the grace of God to come into our lives. However, James has one final thing to say to us. And with, and this is our second point. And with this, he digs deeper. Read with me verse 9 to 12, the last part of this section. With it, we bless our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. What we see in these verses is what our words reveal. James has, has taught, of the, uh, taught us of the great power of the tongue. Now he goes to share with us what that exactly means. And in short, we could summarize it like this. The words that we, re- we use reveal the condition of our hearts. We may have moments where we speak well, where we will use our words to uplift others, to, to speak truth. Moments to, to bless God and to sing of his praises. Yet, in the next moments, we will use our words to tear down and curse our neighbours. And in that moment, we're completely forgetting that they are made in the image of God. See, we are, I'd say we're all very accomplished actors in how we disguise our words and our speech. Think about it for a moment, the the difference you have with your, your public and your private life and the words that you use publicly in comparison to the words privately. I think for all of us, there would be a big difference. Privately, internally, we are always a lot more honest. And we say things, we think things that, to be honest, we are ashamed of and we would never in a million years want anyone to know. But there's a situation that James is subtly putting into our minds in verse 9. It's the idea of a person coming to a place like this, to a church service. You know, they're, they're being polite, they're graciously greeting everyone. As the service begins and they sing the first song, they sing their, to their, they sing their heart out in praise to God. Service ends and they smile and greet everyone and and they get into their car. But as they journey home in their car, they begin to use words and they lay strips into those gathered. They make comments about people gathered, about whoever was involved in the service, about the songs that were selected, about the people that were there and so on. And in the essence, what James is saying, well, this is just the the essence of hypocrisy. We're all well capable of putting on facades and and playing church for everyone to see. But these things should not be, according to James' books, in those moments we're condemning ourselves, we're condemning our brothers in Christ, and we're ultimately condemning Christ himself, the head of the body We're damaging the body of Christ. We're allowing sin to fester in our lives. And with that is when forced fires start. And James wants all of us to recognize that the words that come from our mouths reveal the state of our hearts and our spiritual condition. The reason none of us can tame our tongues is because our problem is much, much deeper than the words that come from our mouths. Once again, James powerfully uses uh, some images to convey his point. A, A spring doesn't pour forth both fresh and salt water. A fig tree doesn't produce olives. Grapevine doesn't produce figs. And then he finally concludes, a salt pond does not yield fresh water. And it's all a reminder from James of what we considered in the previous section with faith and works. 
For the Christian, works do not mix with faith uh, to produce salvation. Rather, they are fruit of true and saving faith. They give evidence of salvation. And James is stirring this idea into our minds again. The fruit that we bear in our lives is never accidental, but is always a product of what is lying within us, the condition of our hearts. So a sinful heart will produce sinful words. And James is merely reiterating the words of Jesus here in Luke chapter 6. Jesus uses a fruit and a tree image to convey the same idea. A good tree, good fruit. And you will know a tree by its fruit. The words that we speak, they're not disconnected from who we are. We never say a random word We don't have an incidental conversation. Evil and malicious words can come from within ourselves. And that means that we need help. And I hope that within all of us this morning, there's a deep desire within all of us to want to change as we have been reflecting on our lives. And maybe the prevailing idea in your head is that, you know, you need to just try a little bit harder. You know, you need a little bit of behavior modification. You know, clean up and look the part. And yes, we need to try, certainly. But that is not ultimately what we need. We need to look deeper because we need heart surgery. Let me challenge you to think about the words that you have said, you've typed, or even thought in the past week. And I'm sure maybe some of us would think and we would be ashamed of what we have said and typed and thought in the past week. We need to all admit our need for change. We need to admit the the grace of God to enter our lives. Maybe for many of us we need to come before our God and repent for the times where we have failed to use our words in a wholesome and edifying manner. But we need to do more than just say sorry. We need to turn to God himself. We need to turn to the eternal word, Jesus Christ himself, for help. We need to turn to the, to the living word of God for help and direction as we think about the impact of our words and recognize what they reveal. So as we close this morning, let me simply ask, how are you using your words? Are they building others up? Are they tearing people down? Possibly we need to be reminded of what James has already said in chapter 1, that every person be quick to hear and slow to speak. But at the same time, recognize our responsibility as Christians. And this brings us full circle to what we thought of at the very beginning that we are, we are gospel people, and gospel people have a gospel message. And that doesn't mean that we become gospel silent, but that we become gospel sharers. The gospel is a message. It is, it is words, and we must share it. We have the greatest message in the, word, in the world. How can we keep it to ourselves? We must share it. But let us be mindful of the practical teaching that James has brought before us. We need to acknowledge the potential, the power of our words, both good and bad. But we we need to be under no illusion that our words reveal the condition of our hearts. So in humility, run to your Lord. Repent. Seek his grace. And in closing, let me share two Proverbs with you. Proverb, both from Proverbs chapter 16. One proverb says this, A worthless man plots evil, and his speech is like a scorching fire. And the second proverb says this, The heart of the wise makes his speeches judicious, and adds persuasiveness to his lips. Gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul, and health 
to the body. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for it and how it impacts and shapes and molds us in our everyday lives. And Father, as we think of our own lives and we think of the past week and for all of us as we've used our words in a way and manner that has not brought glory and honour to you, Lord, we, we say sorry and we repent, acknowledging that we need your grace in our lives. Father, as we turn to you, Lord, we pray that we would want to be more like you. And with that, that we would use our more, words more wholesomely to edify, to build up, to encourage. Lord, would we think more deeply about the impact our words have, but also that what that reveals about us and how that is revealing and testifying to the condition of our souls. Lord, help us to think about this, Lord. But we give you praise that you have not left us on our own. This is an impossible task, but you have helped. You get, you provided your spirit to help us, Lord. You have given us your word to lead and guide, to give us good and gracious instruction. We ask that we would have the humility to heed it and to implement it into our lives. Not that we would look good and impress others that we would point others to you and that we would give you the glory and honour that you deserve. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. In a few moments we will partake of the bread and share with the cup as we remember what Jesus has done on our behalf. But as we um, think about that, we're going to just before that we're going to sing a song together, our fourth item of praise The song's entitled The The Heart of Worship. It's a call um, to come back to the heart of worship as we think about what, why we exist as Christians, why we come here, and that is all for Jesus, to give him the praise and the preeminence in our lives. So as the music begins, let's stand and let's sing softly together. Thank you.
search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you All about you, Jesus I'm sorry from John chapter 19 famous famous words Christ on the cross after this Jesus knowing that all was now finished said to fulfill the scripture I thirst a jar full of sour wine stood there so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth when Jesus had received the sour wine he said it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. I'm thinking primarily this morning of, of words. We've been thinking about the power, impact, potential of our words, but also what they reveal of the condition of our hearts. And as we think of influential, powerful words that have been spoken by historical figures throughout the, the course of time. I'm sure many things will rise to your minds. I'm sure these three words uttered by Jesus on, cross, on the cross have the most impact and have had the most influence on anything that has ever been. Three simple words, one word in the original language, but three words in our English. It is finished. And it really begs the question in a very simple manner, well, what is finished? What is Jesus saying? He is finished. And we know what Jesus is saying. It is finished. That all that had been set before him, his life, the perfection of his life, his, his faithful obedience had been completed. He had lived the life that no human being had ever lived or that would ever live. He had completed it. He had lived a life of complete 
in complete honor and glory to God the Father. And he did that all for our sake. But he did something much more than live a perfect life. He didn't give just a, a great example as much as he did. And we give our praise to Christ for the example that he gives us. But he went one step further as he goes to the cross. And he lays his life down. And he sacrifices his life. Only a perfect person could go to the cross. And Jesus was that perfect person. And even on the cross, he's perfect. And he uses, in the greatest of suffering, he uses his words wholesomely, not to curse other people. Think of the the seven declarations of of Christ on the cross. And they're really just mind-boggling as we think of the pain that, that, that he is going through. Yet he is still perfect and gracious and loving in those moments. It is incredible. It is finished. Christ has accomplished all that we need. We don't need to look anywhere else. We don't need to look into ourselves. We don't need to, to try a little bit harder to earn our salvation. Christ has accomplished it for us. So that is why every week we are reminded and we partake of the emblems that are before us this morning. We think of the bread that reminds us of his body, the excruciating pain and agony it went through. And we think of the, the cup Reminds us of his blood that was shed on our behalf. We're so grateful for those three words. It is finished. Let's uh, pray and and appropriate. I'm going to pray for both the the bread and the wine. And then after that, at the appropriate time, the, the bread will be distributed. And then we will distribute the cup at the appropriate time. So let's bow our heads and let's, let's pray. Father, we give you our thanks for Jesus, the perfect one who was the perfect sacrifice on the cross. And we thank you from the bottom, from the depths of our hearts for those three words. It is finished. It is finished. Christ came, Christ conquered and has accomplished for us our salvation. Father, we we cannot say thank you enough. We give you our praise. We, We give you our lives because of what you have done for us. Thank you for that, that we can have forgiveness of our sins, that we have the promise of eternal life and for every other blessing and promise and grace that is in between, Lord, we say thank you. And Lord, as we take of the bread, and we take of the cup, Lord, would we be encouraged, and would we be grateful people. And we simply say, thank you, Jesus. Amen.
Just a little bit of housekeeping. Please uh, keep hold of your cup and on your way out, you'll see there will be a basket on each, each of the exits. You can put your uh, uh, cup in there and they'll be properly um, disposed of. And please mindful of the offering boxes as well. Very much grateful for the, the kind support and financial support. I'm sure the elders and deacons are indebted and give you our thanks for that, for the um, selfless giving that has been over these very difficult and strange times. If you're on my right and your left, please leave through this door, please. And if you're on my left, your right, uh, please make your way out through the, the door that you came in. Um, please do that swiftly and you can have conversation outside, socially distanced, of course. But as we come to the close of our service, let's give our thanks to God and let's pray in closing. Our Father, we give you our thanks for all that we have thought about and considered this morning. Thank you for your precious word to us. Lord, thank you that it edifies, it sharpens us, it conforms us into the likeness and the image of yourself. And for that, we are thankful and we're grateful. God, we thank you for who you are. Thank you that you are a good, a great, a gracious, and a, a loving God. And Lord, we thank you that we can know that to be true from your word, and we can know that as we think of the life of your son, Jesus Christ, as we have just thought about in our time around the table. Lord, we ask your blessing upon us as we go our, our separate ways. We ask that you would keep us safe, protect us in our travels, bring us to a place of worship soon. Lord, we pray for those who are at home who would love to be here, Lord. Protect them, keep them safe. Wherever they may find themselves, Lord, would they know your care and your comfort and your keeping. Lord, we give you our praise for you and you alone are worthy. And we pray in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless.